കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം നമസ്തേ and welcome to the penultimate episode of Trig Drishya Viveka. Today we're going to look at the result of practicing samadhi. Text 30. Deha bhimane galite vignate paramatmani yatra yatra mane yati tatra tatra samadhaya with the disappearance of the attachment to the body and with the realization of the supreme self to whatever object the mind is directed one experiences samadhi text 31 bhidyate hridaya grandhi dvidyante sarva sanshaha kshiyante chasya karmani By beholding him who is high and low, the fetters of the heart are broken, all doubts are solved, and all his karmas, activities and their effects, wear away. So, after practicing samadhi for some time, one starts to realize within oneself that actually the supreme brahman is everywhere and is everything but in the objects it is covered by the appearances of name and form the upadis and there is also a projection from the mind due to the vasanas or mental tendencies inherited from previous lives desires and so on So we tend to see the world in a certain way according to our desire. And of course all these things both the the limiting adjuncts the upadis and the projected views the vasanas are based on the thought I. Therefore the Upanishadic process is the inquiry who am I? who am i really huh we have an ego which is actually simply a thought and if we inquire into this ego we see that it's something made uh, something speculated created out of nothing by the mind and then if we probe deeper we find that these thoughts this mind which is simply an aggregate of all the thoughts there isn't a thing called mind the aggregate of all these thoughts is i and then something that i identifies with so this false ego uses the uh, process of identification to amass a collection of things <laughs> to justify its existence i am this body these are my senses and this is my house these are my clothes this is my car this is my job i am the manager of so and so in my company <laughs> and on and on and on and on and on just watch your mind huh sit and watch your mind and watch how every single thought is based on this identification of i but what is i really if we look into it it's simply this projection <laughs> and it's the covering the covering of consciousness by the mind consciousness is the self but when it's reflected in the mind and the senses it appears that the body and the mind are conscious are living but actually they're mere mechanisms they are simply uh 
an organic computer, let's say, huh? and we lend our consciousness to it, giving it the appearance of being alive and having agency and activities and being the possessor and enjoyer of things and so on and so on and so on. But this is all false because it's based on a false premise. Huh? If I have a mathematical problem that takes, let's say, 10 pages of calculations and I make a mistake on the very first line of the first page, the whole thing is off. It's useless. Similarly, on the very first thought in the mind, we create an illusion called I. Then all the thoughts that come after it, which are based on it, are also an illusion. Isn't it? They're wrong. They're incorrect. The actual view, the truth, is beyond the mind, is beyond thoughts. It cannot be thought into being. Uh, so those people who think simply by reading the Vedas or simply by hearing from a teacher and maybe practicing a little show meditation, <laughs> that they are enlightened, are absolutely off base. Uh, this is not supported by the Vedas. So what is supported is that the Vedas provide like a map of the territory. This is Brahman, these are the coverings, these are the projections and identifications of the mind. And then now you have to sit down and go through these, tag them, if you will, just like you might tag a post on, on uh, some social network or whatever. No, this is not it, this is not it. Neti neti, huh? Rejecting the false identifications and projections, the false limitations of the true self, which is Brahman. Brahman is sometimes called God, but we don't like that word God because it conjures up Christian images of an old man, a cranky, you know, old man up in the sky sending people to hell if they don't love him or his son. <laughs> No, that's not God. That's not the absolute. That's not the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is this conceptual structure that Brahman is all that exists, but it apparently becomes covered. And so because of this apparency, of individuality and the existence of many, many different objects. We fall into illusion. So to revert to our original consciousness, our original self, we have to practice some process, but this process is not a change. It's not an addition. It's not an attainment. Huh? It's not a transformation because those are qualities that belong to illusion. The actual truth never changes. It has always been and will always be Brahman. So when we realize Brahman within ourselves, when we find that ground of being, that unchanging pure awareness without qualities, without boundaries, beyond time and space, then from that point on, we can see Brahman in everything. And this is the point of the first verse, that when one realizes Brahman within oneself, the next step is to realize it within everything and see that everything is Brahman. There was one previous verse, I'll link to it here, that there are five qualities in every object. Sat, Chit, Ananda, or existence, consciousness, bliss, name and form. Name and form belong to Maya, what is not. And existence, consciousness, and bliss belong to Brahman, 
which is. That is the reality. This is the truth. So this truth can be seen everywhere if we have the eyes to look. It's easier to discover Brahman within oneself because within oneself, one has a laboratory where you can perform the experiment of separating these qualities. And we can see that the mind is nothing but name and form. And name and form is temporary. It's always changing. So that can't be the truth. But there's a very nice saying in the Vedas, and it's repeated several times, for example, in Bhagavad Gita, that the, the true self is smaller than the smallest and greater than the greatest. This isn't just a theory. This is a fact. In fact, it's a meditation technique. If you have trouble identifying Brahman as pure consciousness, then visualize yourself becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller tinier than an atom. Huh? If the mind can conceive of the atom and learn its structure, that means mind is more subtle than the atom. But even more subtle than the mind is consciousness. So by making our consciousness smaller and smaller and smaller, until it's smaller than even the smallest structure of the atom, and so on, we arrive at the ground of being. Uh, it's one sinks lower and lower and lower into oneself, deeper and deeper, zooming in more and more, until finally there are no recognizable names and forms. There's only consciousness. This is Brahman. And conversely, once Brahman is recognized, one can zoom out bigger and bigger and bigger huh? until all the forms that we know of, even the whole creation, is just an insignificant dot and finally just disappears in the vastness of Brahman. And Brahman is all that's left. Just like there are some tantras that recommend meditation on the void, and also the Buddha, of course, recommended this meditation. So the void is infinite space. Infinite means that anything finite, such as the created universe, is eventually just going to disappear in it. Huh? Because <laughs> compared to infinity, even the, the whole creation is just nothing. But if you do this exercise, if you actually meditate on the void, you'll find something keeps popping up. <laughs> that something is you, Brahman, consciousness. Who is aware of the void? Whose consciousness is penetrating and filling that void so as to be aware of its emptiness? It can only be the self. It can only be Brahman. So then we see very clearly that this universal self becomes individualized and particularized in the form and names of this world. And we can also observe by cultivation of consciousness that when we go to sleep at night, the whole world disappears. And then again, it appears in the morning. <laughs> so, what is this world? It's just a dream. Uh, in our dream of sleep at night, so many things appear and disappear, change. And in our dream of waking, so many things appear and disappear and change. What's the difference? The only thing that dreaming and sleep have in common is that we're conscious. We're conscious even during deep sleep. And this is our rest in the lap of Brahman. We can experience all these things by practice. And then we get the result, which is self-realization, realization of Brahman. And this is confirmed in the Upanishads. There's some nice quotes in the commentary here. 
He who knows Brahman verily becomes Brahman. It's in the Mundaka Upanishad. The knower of Brahman attains the highest. That's from Taitri Upanishad. The knower of self goes beyond grief. It's in Shvetashvatara Upanishad. O oh, Janaka, you have attained fearlessness. That's in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. O oh, Maitreyi, thus far goes immortality. Brihadaranyaka Upanishad again. Knowing self, one goes beyond death. Shvetashvatara Upanishad. And the self only is all this. Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. So when we realize this self, we realize it not only within ourselves, but also outside. And we see that everything is actually the self without limitation. The only limitations are apparent. They're projections of the mind based on our desires, huh? vasanas and upadis. So this is like an overlay on the self. Huh? But this is not the self you're looking for. <laughs> the real self is unlimited, unconditioned, tremendously potent, full of bliss and knowledge of everything. And we can connect with this self because we are this self. All it takes is the practice. And the only thing that's separating you from this realization is sitting down and doing the work of meditation and realizing it for yourself. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.